Hello, I'm Lauren Wenzel. I'm the director of the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar today. It's held in cooperation with OCTO and the National Ocean Protection Coalition. Um, today, we're going to be hearing about the why behind 30 by 30, the state of science on marine protected area benefits. And I will introduce our speakers here in just a moment. But what I wanted to do first is give you a little context around the 30 by 30 conservation goal. This is a global goal to protect 30% of the planet's land and ocean that the Convention for Biological Diversity is expected to formally adopt later this year. And several countries have already committed to this goal. It builds on previous conservation targets. In 2006, Micronesia took a global leadership role in establishing a goal to protect 30% of its nearshore environment. And in 2010, the Convention on Biological Diversity established Aichi Target 11, which called for 10% of the world's ocean to be protected by 2020. The scientific community has recommended a more ambitious goal to protect our planet's biodiversity and the services it provides. In January of this year, President Biden issued an executive order on climate that calls for conservation of 30% of the nation's lands and waters, phrasing the US target a little bit differently than the global target. It's important to note that while today's talk is about the science of marine protected areas, the definition of what kinds of areas will count toward the US 30% goal has not yet been decided and will be informed by a public comment period that will take place starting shortly. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, uh, Sarah Maxwell, Juan Mayorga, and Ann Gary. And I will give you a little bit of background on each of them. Dr. Sarah Maxwell is an assistant professor at the University of Washington on the Bothell campus at the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, where she leads the Marine Sustainability Ecology Lab. Her research focuses on the development of science-based solutions to the conservation and management issues in the ocean, and her expertise is on the application of spatial tools such as satellite tracking and oceanographic modeling. Juan Mayorca is a marine scientist and conservationist dedicated to make a difference for the protection, sustainable use, and understanding of our oceans. Juan's emerging ocean monitoring technologies in combination with uh, marine ecology, fishery science, and economics to glean insights into our oceans, socio-ecological systems, and inform conservation policy. Currently, Juan leads a partnership between the National Geographic Society's Pristine Seas Project and the Environmental Market Solutions Lab at UC Santa Barbara. And Dr. Ann Gary is the Chief Strategy Officer and Lead Scientist at the Natural Capital Project at Stanford University. She spearheads the Sustainable Livable Cities Program and co-leads NatCap's Marine and Coastal Program. Before working at NatCap, she was a National Research Fe Council Fellow at NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. She received her PhD in zoology from Oregon State University and is fascinated by the relationship between people and nature. So um, welcome, all of you. Really excited to be uh, hearing from you today, and I will turn it over to Sarah. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm so excited to be here to be giving this presentation. Um, and so my role today, a little bit smaller. Okay, my role today is going to be um, just kind of framing this uh, presentation today or our, our overall seminar. I'll be talking a little bit about what is an MPA, um, what are benefits that can be derived from MPAs, um, how these benefits can be achieved. Um, a little bit about large marine protected areas, and then um, I want to talk about something a little bit new, um, the idea of mobile marine protected areas. It's something I'm really excited about and um, something that I think can add some interesting sort of food for thought to the 30 by 30 discussion. So just so we're all on the same page um, to start, what is a marine protected area? The IUCN definition is a clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. Um, this definition is also used by the US um, as part of an effort to align um, US MPA work um, better with global work on marine protected areas. 
So what kind of benefits can we see from rain protected areas? Um, there's a whole suite of them, but I think the ones that are um, the, of the most interest to most people are that we see um, increases in number and size of organisms within their boundaries. So for example, Jen Cassell's work showed that there were increases both inside and outside marine protected areas for targeted and non-targeted species um, in the Channel Islands uh, marine protected areas. Um, we see things like increases in species richness and biodiversity benefits. And we also see um, what's known as um, spillover benefits, where there's like an increase in the number and size of MPAs, uh, size of animals, um, both inside and outside MPAs. So the animals that are protected within MPAs kind of spill over into the surrounding area because of the fluid nature of the ocean. Fences don't apply in the marine realm, and so animals can move freely over uh, across boundaries. Um, and this kind of thing sort of makes sense. Um, and it's something that we've seen, for example, in Southern California um, in the lobster fishery, where just a 35% reduction in fishing area led to a 225% increase in catch in just six years. I um, mean, there are some great papers out there that review a lot of these benefits. So for example, a paper by Sarah Lester in, two, uh, in 2009. Um, and of course, there's a lot of variability um, in the benefits that we see, and I'll get to that in a bit. So where does the U.S. stand as far as um, MPA? Um, how far, MPAs, how far are we from reaching this 30% goal within our waters? Um, and so this map is one from the National Marine Protected Area Center, um, and it shows that according to them, uh, there are uh, the estimate in June of 2020 was that there are 26% of US waters protected um, under the IUCN definition of, of an MPA. Um, so we still have a little ways to go um, in order to get to that 30% target. But I think one big question is what kind of actual protection does this 26% actually offer? Um, if we go back to our definition of MPA, um, there's some nuance here. Um, what's meant by the protected in protected area? Um, if I were to ask every single one of you that's listening to this call, um, you would have a, de a different definition. Everyone would have a different answer. Um, what does manage mean in terms of human access or uses, to, uh, uses of an area? Um, does it mean, for example, no commercial fishing? Does it mean no recreational fishing? What about shipping, tourism? Um, does it mean no access by anyone ever? Um, what is management mean in terms of design? Does it mean that uh, local communities are involved in management? That traditional uses of an area will also be conserved or allowed? And also just more logistical questions like how big do we need an MPA to be in order to conserve and manage whatever we're aiming to protect? And I think what quickly becomes clear is that not all MPAs are created equal. Um, and there are a lot of critical condition, uh, considerations for reaching the 30 by 30, excuse me, the 30 by 30 goal and doing it in an effective and an equitable manner, um, which is something that the Biden-Harris administration has been striving for and is also a critical part of the UN sustainability goals. So thankfully, this has actually been an active area of research for a number of years. Um, there are a number of studies looking at existing MPAs um, and have shown that the best ecological outcomes occur, particularly when MPAs are large, so greater than about 100 kilometers squared, when they're old, meaning that benefits really accrue and increase over time, particularly after about 10 years, when MPAs are isolated, whether that be from humans or simply isolated such that the boundaries of them are very clear um, based on other um, ecological uh, markers, when they're well protected, so ideally there are no extractive activities, so also known as no-take, um, and also well enforced. And something else we see, and I'm sure Anne will talk about this more, is that equitable management also leads to um, better ecological outcomes. Um, when we apply co-management to marine protected areas, uh, when stakeholders participate in both the design and management and monitoring of MPAs, um, and when institutional design 
principles are put into practice. These are the Ostrom principles, if you've heard about the heard about those before, things like clearly defined boundaries, collective choice arrangements, conflict resolution mechanisms being put into place, et cetera. So we know a decent, about, a decent amount about what works and what also doesn't in terms of MPAs having strong ecological outcomes. So to shift gears slightly, um, one way that a lot of countries have been moving towards reaching um, these targets that we've had over the years, whether that be 20%, 30%, et cetera, is to create um, really large MPAs, MPAs that just are really huge in space. Um, and there are a lot of purported benefits to these large MPAs, including that they can protect whole ecosystems, they can protect large-scale oceanographic processes and ecosystem processes, um, that they can um, also potentially protect wide-ranging species that are highly mobile and actually capture the entirety of their ranges. But depending on the limitations within these areas, there can be incredible costs in terms of both socioeconomics and also equity. And even really large scale boundaries couldn't, uh, for example, protect the entire ranges of Laysan albatrosses that you see here. Now try imagine drawing a bound, uh, boundary around the movements of elephant seals. Um, an MPA that large would be totally politically unfeasible. So I would argue that what we need are boundaries, in some cases, what we need are boundaries that can move and shift in time, just like animals and the ocean and also humans do. And so this leads us to this emerging idea of mobile MPAs. So what is a mobile MPA? Basically, we can just add to our definition of a regular MPA to say it's a clearly defined geographic space that's managed to achieve conservation, but one that shifts in response to changes in mobile, in mobile species or oceanographic habitats through space and time. And I personally think that the most compelling argument for mobile MPAs um, is that they will become almost imperative under climate change. Um, let's not forget the executive order. Um, the whole point of the executive order order is to tackle cl the climate crisis. Um, it's about safeguarding against climate change and using MPAs as a way to do that. So what happens if we set up static MPAs, 30% of US waters, and the things we're aiming to shift, or we're aiming to protect simply shift out of the boundaries? And there have been some studies that have looked at the likelihood of that happening. Um, one, some, uh, some studies, including this one by Davies et al., um, says that uh, particularly large MPAs will still do okay under climate change, but the primary reason for that is because many species uh, will have actually contraction of their ranges as a result of climate change. Um, whereas other studies have suggested that MPAs will do quite poorly and particularly in tropical regions. So this is, um, there's some really big considerations here in terms of MPAs and climate change. So I would argue that in some instances, protected areas that are mobile in space and time just makes sense in a lot of ways. Um, mobile MPAs could protect these dy dynamic um, oceanographic habitats or species that are likely to see really big shifts under climate change. Um, they could protect um, connectivity corridors between static MPAs and kind of future-proof them against climate shifts. And I think most critically, um, there's uh, a, quite a, a lot of pot potential um, to decrease impacts on humans using mobile marine protected areas. Um, we've seen with dynamic management that uh, using dynamic approaches such as mobile MPAs can actually result in less management less area off limits to human users, so less socioeconomic, less equity issues, um, and also just decreasing management area. So decreasing the amount of conflict that can um, come up in the process of managing um, ecological systems. And also 
Um, dynamic management just fits the dynamic system that we're working in. The ocean is incredibly fluid, as are the animals within it, as are the humans that use it. So it just fits the system better. So the big question always is, oh, oh, well, let's see an example of a mobile IPA. Well, there aren't any yet. <laughs> but dynamic management is really laying the groundwork. Um, if you're not familiar with dynamic management, there's a few um, papers there listed. Um, and it's really similar in concept in that the idea are that is that management really shifts and moves in space and time. And we have a number of existing examples of dynamic management. Another question that often comes up is how would we define boundaries? Part of the definition of an MPA is that it has um, a boundary in geographical space. And the same thing can apply in a mobile context. So for example, environmental characteristics such as sea surface temperature could be used to define boundaries instead of static latitude and longitude coordinates. Um, it could be defined by, this, by the presence of specific species, whether that be visual or acoustic detection. Um, it also could be, um, the boundaries could also be uh, defined by predicting habitats or species occupancy um, using modeling or forecasting. And that first paper, that Hobde and Hartman paper, um, gives a really great example of that in a dynamic management context. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and I'll pass it back to Lauren to introduce our next speaker and I look forward to questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I've introduced Juan, so I'm just going to turn the podium over to you. Thanks, Juan. I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Lauren, for the introduction and for inviting me to this panel. Thanks everyone for tuning in to, to the webinar. Um, today, I will be speaking about the benefits of MPAs uh, through the lens of climate change adaptation, as well as mitigation. Now, as, as we all know, the ocean and marine life is certainly being impacted heavily by climate change. Uh, the ocean has become 26% more acidic than it was in pre-industrial times. It's lost uh, about 2% of its oxygen in the last 50 years, and it's less productive than it once was, and we are already seeing this impacts on fish yields. Um, and a lot of research has been focused and continues to focus on understanding more of these impacts. But I argue that it's also important to change the narrative and think of the ocean as, as one of our greatest allies in, in this fight. Uh, it has absorbed about a third of the CO2 emissions uh, that we have uh, emitted into the atmosphere and captured close to 90% of the extra heat. And it is also home to the world's largest carbon reservoir. So I think it's key that we realize these opportunities that we have and that we work to keep the ocean as part of the solution and not before we turn it into perhaps part of the problem. Now, the key reason why we are talking about climate change in a panel about ocean conservation is that the climate and biodiversity crisis are intrinsically linked. They are really one and the same, and it's not possible to solve one without solving uh, the other. Um, if current trend, trends in habitat conversion uh, biodiversity loss and of course emissions do not peak by 2030, then it will become impossible to remain below 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, a point after which the planet as we know it and the ecosystems and benefits we derive from them today will begin to, to unravel. So these two crises are joined at the hip. In fact, maximizing carbon sequestration has been one of the five fundamental goals of the field of conservation biology. Uh, for decades, along with representation of all native ecosystem types, uh, saving species, meaning maintaining viable populations of native species in their natural patterns, uh, maintaining ecological functions and ecosystem services, and of course, keeping the evolutionary processes and the evolutionary history of, of marine life and terrestrial life as well. And protected areas are really the cornerstone 
cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. And uh, decades of research suggests that to achieve these five goals, we need somewhere in between 25 to 75 percent of land or water managed for conservation. And I think it's really important this last part to emphasize that what we really need is those areas that are whose primary focus is conservation of biodiversity. Uh, the exact number, of course, varies by geographic region. Uh, but the important point here is that we are ways off at a global scale to reaching the amount of protection that we need if we want to continue enjoying the benefits that a healthy ocean provides to us. Of course, the most direct way to curb climate change and its impacts on biodiversity is to cut down emissions uh, as fast as possible. MPAs won't halt many of the threats climate change poses on the marine environment. Uh, but mounting evidence suggests that they are such a powerful tool to ameliorate some of these threats, slow the development of other ones, and improve the overall outlook of marine ecosystems and the services we get from them, uh, now more than ever in times of great uncertainty and ecological upheaval. So as I mentioned before, the ocean is really one of our greatest allies to deal with climate change and protecting 30% of it for conservation and sustainably managing the remaining 70% would ensure it stays that way. So as, as I mentioned, MPAs can't do a lot of things. They can't stop sea level rise. They certainly can't reduce the frequency or magnitude of extreme events, slow down ocean warming, uh, or prevent the shift in the species distributions and the resulting community shifts uh, as the species move, tracking their preferred environmental uh, conditions. Neither can protected areas avoid ocean deoxygenation, which is caused by warming sea surface temperatures and increased estratification of the ocean. And this last one, it seems like coral reefs, uh, as um, Sarah mentioned er er before, and some other tropical uh, ecosystems may not be safeguarded from extreme events, such as, for example, bleaching. Uh, the evidence of, on this is a cubicle, for examples of going both ways, but for now, I'm just going to leave it here in the bucket of the things that MPAs can't help with. But MPAs can do a lot of things. They can promote generic diversity, which are the raw materials for adaptation. Uh, with MPAs, we can protect coastal wetlands uh, in habitats such as mangrove forests that have uh, special marine plants with very high rates of photosynthesis which reduce the local CO2 during the daytime and act as sort of a daytime refugia to uh, vulnerable organisms. Uh, these ecosystems are some of the most carbon rich in the world and by protecting them, we're also protecting these stores, but also the sequestration processes to, that lead to them in the first place. And these coastal habitats are our first and natural defense against sea level rise, storms, Lots, et cetera. Uh, there are very strong theoretical underpinnings for how, why MPAs can facilitate the recovery of ecosystems following climate related disturbances. Uh, this has been a little bit tricky to test for and detect on the field, partly because a lot of our protected areas are relatively young, and also because of the variety of protected areas out there with different levels of protection. Uh, protected areas can definitely serve as refugia and save stepping stones for species that are on the move following their preferred climate conditions. And they can definitely promote larger fish stocks to sustain fisheries on their uncertainty. Something that is very, very important is that as stocks starts to move and shift and shift on from one nation's jurisdiction to another, that may not have management plans in place protected areas can be a critical tool uh, that acts as an insurance policy to safeguard the long-term sustainability of those moving stocks. Uh, protected areas can also protect key animals, such as large sharks and predators that reinvigorate natural carbon sinks by, by controlling fair beavers. Um, similarly, MPAs can promote high abundances of mesopelagic fish and large predatory fish that Although the science is relatively young, we know that they are in very important roles for the cycling of organic and inorganic carbon in the ocean. 
And of course, protected areas can also prevent the release of carbon that had been stored in sediments uh, for millennia from destructive practices such as deep sea mining or bottom trawling. And uh, last but not least, NPAs are our insurance policy against inadequate management, but also unexpected uh, consequences of, of climate change. They are a way to imbue the precautionary principle into ocean management. And uh, I'm not saying that MPAs are a substitute for carbon greenhouse gas emissions, nor can they on their own ensure that marine uh, biodiversity thrives. We also need effective fisheries management and pollution control and other management actions. But given the bundle and the, the benefits that MPAs can provide, they're one of the most cost-effective tools that we have to increase human and environmental uh, well-being. Now, for the last couple of minutes of the talk, I will uh, shift gears a bit and sh share a closer look at the second to last item, uh, in particular, the overlooked impacts of bottom trawling on, on carbon stocks. Uh, this is part of a research project and paper that we recently published, where we presented a new framework to integrate um, carbon protection and fisheries replenishment with biodiversity conservation and identify what are the global priorities for ocean conservation uh, as we move into the next into, into this next decade. But to do this, we first needed to create a map of the global carbon, uh, a map of carbon uh, that is stored in the first meter of ocean sediments. Uh, and this is the map that I'm showing in this slide, which was built collating thousands and thousands of data points from sediment core samples taken around the world. And not surprisingly, we found that the first meter of the ocean floor stores more than twice the carbon that all of the terrestrial soils combine. Uh, but this map on its own doesn't really tell us anything about priorities uh, for conservation. We also need to understand and know how the human impacts that uh, we can abate with protected areas are distributed in space. So next we then used uh, high resolution vessel tracking data to understand the extent and the intensity of bottom trawling around the world. And in combination with information on the width of the of the nets that they drag over the seafloor, the penetration depth of those of those nets uh, on the on the sediments, uh, what type of sediments is being trolled over, uh, it's important because it determines uh, the fraction of the carbon store there that is labile, meaning it's more rarely metabolized into, into CO2, as well as other physical characteristics of the ocean in which this activity is happening. And with all of those things combined, we produce this map uh, that I'm showing here that tells us the, the fraction of the carbon stored in each one kilometer square pixel that is uh, remineralized into aqua CO2. CO2 in the water column following disturbance from, from trawling. And as you can see, this map is quite hard to, to see because the, actually the footprint, the spatial footprint of bottom trawling is relatively small. Uh, it covers less than 5 million square kilometers each year around the world, and it's about 1.2% of the ocean stroke each year. Yet, this disturbance we estimate uh, generates between 0 0.6 and 1.4 billion uh, tons of CO2 uh, released into the water column. Now, as a reference point, the global aviation industry emits about 1 billion ton directly into the atmosphere. And even though these are not directly comparable, because uh, here we're talking about CO2 staying in the water, um, it does gives us a good idea of the magnitude and the importance that this uh, might might have that we have uh, overlooked before. Now, combining those two maps that I showed before, we then can create these global maps of what are the best places that we can strategically place protected areas uh, to protect carbon, and that's what we're seeing in this in this map. Uh, in light blue, we have the uh, existing highly protected areas of the world that cover a little bit less than three percent of the planet. And in very dark and very bright yellow, we have the next priority areas to protect if we wanted to reach 5% of the global ocean under high protection 
for carbon. Then the, the next color that is bright green is the next 5%. We want to reach 10% and so on and so forth. Now, as I mentioned before, this carbon uh, work is part of a larger uh, project in which we also wanted to look at places where NPS can be strategically placed for biodiversity and for fisheries. So this next map shows the places where NPS would be the most effective at protecting biodiversity. And this includes minimizing the species extinction risk, evolutionary distinctive, distinctiveness, the functional roles of the species, and the color scheme here is the same. And this is the map that tells us the places that we can strategically place NPAs to maximize the, the effect that they can have on replenishing overfished uh, fishers. But perhaps I think the greatest contribution of this work is to be able to combine all of these objectives or really any other set of objectives that one could have and plan and optimize for them simultaneously. And one example of that is this map that shows uh, the priorities for conservation if we were to value biodiversity, carbon, and fisheries uh, the same. Um, so with that, I will end this, this, this talk. Thank you so much, everyone, for paying attention and uh, looking forward to your questions uh, in a little bit. I will hand it back uh, to Laura. Okay, thanks very much. And, and Anne, please take it away. You have the podium. All right, thanks. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation to talk today and to Sarah and Juan for great presentations so far. So my charge is to um, hold on, I'm just seeing, all right, here we go. My charge is to talk about MPAs and people. So these two images, a painting of George Floyd and a graph of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years, speak volumes. To me, they're emblematic of our time. They're fundamentally linked because they tell the stories of profoundly ruinous systems and the need for wide-scale transformation. They speak to the need for different kinds of thinking and different ways of doing things. And they both highlight careful consideration of equity and the importance of thinking beyond the short term, both in terms of looking forward and back. But change is hard, so we can look for win-win solutions um, as much as possible uh, in a sort of a rising tides floating all boats kind of way. As systems change, some people will lose things that they're accustomed to. But if we strive for a just and sustainable future, we'll look out in particular for the most vulnerable amongst us, not the loudest or the most powerful. We'll engage diverse voices to look for just and equitable solutions. My colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center have thought a lot about transformations. In the US in particular now, with a new administration, we have a window of opportunity to affect large scale change. We're at the point where we need to keep preparing for transformation by opening up new trajectories and beta testing alternative solutions so that we can begin navigating the transition, launching new initiatives and scaling up innovation. We've got to do the hard work of moving this ball up the hill. One window of opportunity is the executive order on 30 by 30. I'm not gonna talk about scientific support for the 30 by 30 goal. One can argue about 30%, its origins and its justification, but rather I'll focus on the connections between the health of people and communities and the health of the ecosystems on which we all depend. I'll focus on understanding and communicating ecosystem services or the benefits that people get from nature and how that can open up new trajectories so that we can get that ball moving up the hill. So here's my primary argument. A focus on ecosystem services can help accomplish three critical things. First, it can help make the argument for stewardship 
by communicating the linkages between functioning ecosystems and human well-being. Second, facial information about ecosystem services can help target conservation and protection to best accomplish stated goals. And finally, if done right, it can sharpen the focus on people and communities through co-development and co-creation, building virtuous circles where protected areas support people and thus people support protected areas. Marine and coastal ecosystems provide diverse services to people. For example, globally, 3 billion people rely on seafood as a primary source of protein. Coastal and marine tourism supports more than 6.5 million jobs globally. Hazard risk reduction benefits of U.S. coral reefs have just been shown to exceed $1.8 billion a year. As Juan was just talking about, the ocean has absorbed the equivalent of 39% of carbon emissions since 1750, significantly mitigate, mitigating increases in atmospheric CO2 and its associated warming. Healthy coastal ecosystems can reduce exposure to pathogens of humans, fish, and invertebrates. Oceans serve as a reservoir of genetic diversity, providing resilience and chemicals important in pharmaceuticals and other kinds of things. And then, of course, there's all those unquantifiable things like education, livelihoods, and inspiration. Digging deeper into just one of those fisheries, it's important to think about who benefits from these different services. Different communities can depend on different services in very different ways. For example, coastal indigenous peoples consume about 2.1 million metric tons of seafood per year, with consumption per capita 15 times higher than non-indigenous country populations. So in red here is the global mean, and then there's consumption per capita for coastal indigenous peoples in different regions. So the who really matters here. Of course, as systems are degraded, so too are the benefits that they provide to people, unsurprisingly. So for example, unsustainable fishing practices have resulted in depletion of wild fish populations. And another example, destruction of coastal habitats along U.S. coastlines would double the risk to people from coastal hazards. My organization, the Natural Capital Project, pioneers science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. Fundamentally, we work with partners around the world to use understanding of nature's benefits to people to target investments in nature that improve the well-being of both people and nature. So I've spent most of my career thinking about shades of gray, not simply the black and white of protected areas versus working land or seascapes, but about the whole spectrum of social ecological systems from relatively wild to intensive use. Thinking about how to arrange and rearrange human activities to minimize damage to ecological systems so that they can continue to support biodiversity and to provide for people today and in the long term. So with that critical context in mind, marine protected areas are an important tool within the broader scheme of marine planning. As Sarah showed, we've got about 7.9% of the global ocean in protected areas today with about 2.7% in highly protected areas. And MPAs can help protect ecosystems and the services they provide to people. As Sarah showed, biological impacts of MPAs are well described and in many cases not particularly surprising. The social impacts, however, are less clear. So for example, Mike Masha and colleagues reviewed the literature for the social impacts of MPAs in 2010 and found that food security was stable or increased in regions with MPAs, particularly older and smaller MPAs, and that resource rights improved. 
they didn't find enough data to be able to assess impacts on employment, community organization, or income. Natalie Ban and her team took advantage of an explosion of studies and explored similar impacts nine years later. Her synthesis of 118 papers analyzing outcomes of MPAs on well being found that overall, half of the impacts were positive and about a third were negative. Notably, catch per unit effort and community involvement were often positively associated with MPAs and the costs of fishing and conflict were negatively associated with MPAs. Sliced differently, standouts include community-based MPAs and those with high compliance being more likely to have positive effects. So back to this slide from earlier, my Primary argument here is that a focus on ecosystem services can help make the argument for stewardship, can target conservation and protection, and sharpen the focus on people and communities so that co-created MPAs support people and vice versa. So I'm gonna wrap up with three quick case studies. One of using ecosystem services to help make the argument for MPAs and two of using ecosystem services to help make decisions about where to put MPAs while start sharpening the focus on people, both as beneficiaries of ecosystem services and as participants in stewardship. So first is work led by Katie Arkema at NACAP in 2017 on the valuation of existing marine protected areas in the Bahamas. Our team focused on the value provided by four ecosystem services, tourism, coastal protection, nursery habitat for spiny lobster, and carbon storage for climate mitigation. We find it best to measure ecosystem services in both biophysical and economic terms. So you'll see both types of values reported in the second column here. A key element of using ecosystem services to inform decisions is recognizing that not all places are created equal, like Juan was just showing. Spatial variation in coastal systems, both ecological and social, leads to spatial variation in the ecosystem services provided by different MPAs. For example, tourism values in this case were, we saw were dependent on differences in visitation across different islands, the extent of uh, natural habitats, access, and infrastructure. So this kind of information can be useful to make the argument for MPAs, but also to begin to make decisions about the where and how of protection and restoration. This work helped inform an Inter-American Development Bank loan to the Bahamian government for strengthening MPAs and supporting inclusive economic growth. My second case is about marine planning in British Columbia, where we worked with a public-private partnership called the West Coast Aquatic Management Board to inform spatial planning on the west coast of Vancouver Island. The West Coast Aquatic Management Board, including members of government from First Nations and from the province, as well as from various industries and NGOs, led a deeply participatory process to explore community visions and values, trying to understand how local communities use marine and coastal environments today and what their vision is for the future. They then worked closely with First Nations bands to co-create spatial plans for different regions within their territories. To help guide conversations, we mapped various uses of the marine environments, shown here as Lemons Inlet, which is in the traditional territory of the Tolokwiat First Nation. On the left is the baseline, followed by a conservation scenario in which the whole region is designated as a tribal marine park, and then a scenario with expansion of aquaculture. Using our free and open source ecosystem service models in INVEST, we then compared services provided by each scenario relative to the baseline. This allows for making trade-offs explicit. 
According to the models, the Tribal Marine Park increases habitat quality, recreation, and water quality while still increasing the value of shellfish aquaculture harvest, decreasing only the number of recreational homes. Finally, we're working with a large team as part of the Smart Coasts project in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras to understand climate risks, identify and evaluate adaptation options, and inform decisions in the region. Some of the questions the team is asking include, what does the seascape look like if we optimize for different ecosystem services? Where should investments in management actions be prioritized to maximize multiple benefits? And what are the benefits of investing in a particular management action? So we can use spatial information from our ecosystem service models to explore priority locations for, in this case, mangrove protection, if we want to maximize individual services. So the darker areas here in these maps represent places where mangrove protection best increases each of these three services of coastal protection, recreation, and lobster catch. On the left, we see mangrove habitat and existing MPAs along the coast of Belize. One might ask where to prioritize new protections across this seascape. Of course, people often don't want to optimize just one service like I showed in the last slide. So we can put several services together in one analysis to identify priority locations as Juan did globally. This is the same sort of thing on a smaller scale identify priority locations for mangrove protection that optimize across lobster catch, coastal protection, and recreation. So on the right here, you see areas in red are the highest priority for mangrove protection if you want to maximize all three benefits. These kinds of priority areas that fall outside the existing MPA network, shown in these blue hatches, are the smart places to look to expand protections. So of course, it's critical to engage with communities on what, what such protections might look like. So this is an example of a work in progress that shows how we can use detailed spatial information on and ecosystem service models to prioritize protection of regions that are most likely to benefit both people and nature. So to conclude, um, We've got a window of opportunity to transform aspects of our social ecological system that just aren't tenable. We can build recognition of the intimate connections between people and nature into new systems. We need to bring people more fully into marine and coastal conservation. The recognition that healthy ecosystems provide for coastal communities can bring people together, but just recognition isn't enough. We have to think about trade-offs, about winners and losers. We have to involve communities, particularly the most vulnerable, not just the loudest, in iteration of different spatial plans to get to the solutions that work best for communities and for ecosystems. And finally, an ecosystem services approach can help shed light on connections between ecosystems and human well-being so that we can help target lasting stewardship that works for people and the planet. And thanks so much for listening. And I've got some contact information here if you'd like to follow up, but hopefully we've got some good time for discussion. Thanks very much, Anne. So I'd like to invite Juan and Sarah to come back and turn your cameras on. We do have quite a few questions, so I'm just going to get started and hopefully we can get through a few of them. Uh, the first one is, is probably for, for Sarah, um, which is how different is uh, the idea of mobile MPAs from the existing tools that fisheries management uses uh, in terms of protecting fish uh, through spatial and temporal, temporal closures, and how might a mobile MPA be, be managed and enforced? Hmm. Great question. Um, so, you know, in some ways it is, there's a lot of similarity there. Um, I think that, you know, in some ways it becomes a little bit of splitting hairs. Um, dynamic, so the concept of dynamic management, which I kind of alluded to, but didn't discuss, um, is kind of more the umbrella 
under which um, mobile MPAs fall. And so dynamic management is used really broadly, particularly in fisheries. Um, I would argue that maybe the difference there is that a lot of um, in some cases, anyway, closures are based simply on seasons, and um, the whereas in a dynamic management context, or um, by extension, in a mobile MPA context, closures would be based more on real-time information. So there are some really good examples of um, closures that exist. For example, in the scallop fishery in New England, um, there's a really great paper um, by Kate O'Keefe, um, who, and they talk about, um, uh, basically there was a collaboration between um, fishers there and um, University of uh, Massachusetts at Dartmouth, and basically they um, had a they use a grid system for the scallop fishery, and they're trying to minimize um, bycatch of yellowtail flounder. And so they basically report back their bycatch every day to um, to UMass. They put all that information together, and then they send an aggregate out to the entire fleet, saying here are the areas where bycatch is highest avoid these areas. And so it is kind of like, in some ways, like a role, in that case, it's voluntary. So it's like a rolling voluntary closure. Um, and so there is a lot of overlap there, um, but I think the difference is really just about um, being in real time. Um, I think uh, in terms of management, um, I think that there's a lot of potential there. I think a lot of the same, you know, I often get this question of how do you enforce a mobile MPA? You know, how are you going to do that? And I think in the end, it comes down to a lot of the same issues that exist for, for static MPAs. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to um, you know, communication is key. Um, what we found, at least in dynamic management, um, is that uh, there tends to be a much broader willingness and there's a lot more participation um, and um, uh, like, uh, what's the, I'm blanking on the word, like self-enforcement of it, you know, there's a lot more compliance, that's the word, compliance, um, of, of dynamic management approaches because usually, at least in a lot of the cases that we see, there's broad stakeholder participation, oftentimes it's even voluntary, um, and also because they're, because instead of closing off one really big area, the idea is to create a smaller area that might be moving and shifting in time. And so the overall part, that the overall component that's off limits to whatever the human activity is, is smaller. And so generally there's a lot more political buy-in and so there tends to be um, better compliance. And ultimately communication is key. So there's a lot of really good examples of using, um, for example, um, smartphone apps to communicate where boundaries are. Um, most uh, vessels, at least in the US, are equipped with um, the capacity to, to, to communicate and to follow these kind of boundaries in space and time. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Sure. OK, I have a question for Juan here. Um, how does the trade-off work between reducing trawling to increase carbon storage and fisheries benefits, which would be reduced with the reduction in bottom trawling. Does one benefit outweigh the other? Oh, I think, uh, I think you're on mute, Juan. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. So no, that's a that's a really good question, and one that we needs to be carefully considered when uh, you know pulling out uh, trawling effort from the ocean. You know, because I one thing that I, I I maybe I forgot to mention is that MPAs alone won't be sufficient to uh, reduce the uh, carbon effects of bottom trawling on their own, right? If all the all they're doing is displacing bottom trawling to the adjacent pixels or the adjacent part of the ocean that may have even higher carbon content. So uh, I think those analyses need to be done carefully at a local local level, and they are going to be context specific in terms of the comparison between the benefits gained from uh, those reductions in CO2 emissions versus the value of seafood and the jobs and employment that the industry uh, generates. 
Okay, thanks. And um, another question for Juan, just related a lot of interest in this idea of, um, of bottom trawling. Uh, MPAs move effort, but your analysis assumed that effort had taken place effort that had taken place in closed areas disappeared. Uh, if you allowed for that, would there still be an, an impact on bottom trawling? Yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's their MPAs on their own are not, are not the, the, the solution to uh, el completely eliminate that, this, this threat. They need to be coupled with effort reduction programs, uh, vessel buybacks, et cetera after you know doing the, the do analysis on, on the economic impacts of doing that. Um, so that definitely that's something that our analysis didn't touch on and, and it's most most appropriate looked at at a local scale. Okay, great. Um, we had a question about um, why does it take so long to establish MPAs? Um, and and maybe you could comment on this from the social perspective. Um, well, I, it takes a long time to establish MPAs because it takes a long time to get it right. It takes a long time to gather the ecological and social data that you need to decide where it makes sense to do things. We're changing the way people traditionally use these coastal and marine areas. And in order to get these right, it takes a long community involved process. So um, I don't think it's a bad thing that it can take a while to establish them. All right, thanks. Um, and I, another, there was also a question about MPAs in the high seas. If any of you could comment on kind of the status of MPAs in the high seas and also the um, the complementarity of national 30 by 30 efforts with efforts to protect the high seas. I might be the person the most up on that, though that doesn't necessarily say a ton. Um, <laughs> um, so the there is the the um, process that's happening right now um, under the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea um, to basically it, uh, establish more of a process for uh, establishing MPAs on the high seas. Um, the process was delayed because of COVID um, and I'm trying to remember exactly where they are. Um, they're getting close, I believe, to formalizing the language um, for kind of the amendments to the amendment to the treaty. Um, and uh, I don't know specifically that they had, I don't believe, as far as I know, there's not been an adoption to try and do, a, you know, kind of a 30 by 30 on, uh, on the high seas, though I could be wrong about that. There's not anything that I'm aware of. Um, but certainly, you know, broad scale efforts across the globe to do this, you know, would certainly make the most sense. There certainly was um, a lot of buy-in to, um, to try and hit 10% by 2020. Um, and um, we didn't didn't quite get there, but we did get close, depending on um, your definition of you know what what counts there. Thanks. Uh, another question for Anne: Does your ecosystem service model account for connectivity, and how can this be measured? Um, we don't have one ecosystem service model. We have a collection of models for different ecosystem services so for example there's one that addresses coastal hazards there's one that addresses tourism and recreation there's another that looks at connections between nursery habitats and fisheries and so each model is different and addresses connectivity in different ways okay thank you um and I think just to close us out, a couple of people have commented on the um, role of fisheries management and the contributions that fisheries is making and how that may or may not be um, accounted for in some MPA um, tracking. And also as we as we enter this new uh, goal of a, a US 30% goal to conserve waters. So do any have you do any of you have comments on that on the concept of marine conservation areas in the US and how you would like to see this goal um, 
approached in the US. Um, well, I'll just start and say real briefly that I think it's very important for us to, like I said in my talk, rethink the way we do things. And I think it's important to use science to help us understand where it makes sense to target additional protections that bring additional benefits to people and to biodiversity. And that we can do so by thinking carefully about all of the benefits that we get from coastal ecosystems, including fisheries. And so we need to think carefully about coastal communities, which fisheries might benefit from certain kinds of closures, et cetera. So I think it's really important to connect our thinking about the well being of coastal people and coastal communities and the well being of coastal ecosystems. Great, thank you. And I wanted to offer Juan and Sarah any final closing comments you'd like to make before we wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to add? I think I'm good, thank you. What? All right. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, the three of you, really thought-provoking, uh, very information-rich presentations. We had a great turnout, and I'm sure many people will want to listen to the recording. So if you participated today or if you came in late, there will be a recording. It will be shared. So feel free to, um, to stay tuned, and that will be mailed out to all of you um, following this, this webinar. So thanks again to our speakers. Thank you. Bye.